That's right. Does everybody have a sign? Everyone's good? Cool. We're going to get started. Thank you. in New 
York more difficult. Yeah. And Governor Cuomo is right when he says that from here it gets more complicated, not less. Our battle is not nearly over, but all of our hard work is paying off. Today on September 22nd, we're convening in Niagara Square to stand up to Governor Cuomo's plan to open New York to drillers. The entire region is speaking in a unified voice against fracking and demanding a ban on fracking in the state. <laughs> because of waste and infrastructure, fracking will not just impact communities that have drilling, and the negative impacts of fracking can already be seen here in western New York. Today we're going to hear from few speakers, uh, the first being Jeanette Geckler of Cold and Wellbeing about a dangerous gas storage field being built right in their community. We're going to be hearing from Charlie Bowman, a retired biologist and interim director of the Western New York Peace Center, about the battle against radioactive wastewater disposal in Niagara Falls. We're going to be hearing from Sheila Miller, a Food and Water Watch local coordinator and area homeowner who's going to be talking about the economic burden of water testing on property owners. And we're also going to be hearing from Tom Scahill from the IAC about what's going on in Pennsylvania right now. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Jeanette Geckler of Cold and Wellbeing. When I was seven years old, I had a dream. It was an American dream. Oh, it wasn't a bigger important dream like being president, or an ambitious dream like being a movie star, or owning a big business, or having lots of power. It was a very simple dream. I was playing in my parents' backyard after a rain. The yard didn't drain well, so it was full of water, and a great big tree had fallen across the little flood. I put on my red rubber rain boots and climbed up the tree's massive trunk and pretended I was on a sailboat sailing across the sea. And when I surveyed the little flood that made my pretend ocean, then I knew. I knew when I grew up I wanted to live in the country, in the woods, and have a sparkling, clean, real pond of my own. When I got older, I went to college. Like so many, I married. We had children, worked hard, struggled through difficult financial times, scraped and saved, and bought a plot of land in Colden with an old fixer-upper of a house. We are south of the city in higher elevations, so there's plenty of inconveniences. We have to drive a long way to get to work, to shop, and to most events. We live on a hill, and it's a real challenge sometimes getting up that hill in the winter. There are also, of course, there's also, of course, all that snow to shovel and plow. And we have well water. 80% of us in the town have no access to municipal water. We depend on our own wells, pumping water from the aquifer below. But the property's beautiful just as I dreamed it would be. There's so much of the natural world to see and experience. It has woods and fields and a creek in the back with a little waterfall. We have a pond with largemouth bass. During the day, you can see songbirds and turkeys and ducks and geese and herons in the spring, chipmunks and squirrels and foxes and coyotes and raccoons and deer. At night, you can see the stars in the round dome of the sky, completely unobscured by city lights. We taught our children, who now have children of their own, that with energy and imagination, a person doesn't have to have a lot of money to have fun. Our pond is our pool. We float on the pond in inner tubes from giant truck tires. We bought a basic swing set, built a little sandbox. We set up a volleyball net, a horseshoe court, a basketball hoop, and set aside a big space for soccer and touch football. We even made a tiny little putting green by sinking tuna fish cans. We had an organic garden. We worked hard during the week and on our days off, we enjoyed our property for 30 years. And then along came the gas industry with its threat of high volume slick water hydraulic fracturing. Unscrupulous landsmen knocked on the doors of Colden residents with the offer of free fuel and money in exchange for the right to drill for natural gas. These landsmen played down the potential dangers. They denied the threat of toxic chemicals to the aquifers. They avoided discussing pollutants in the air. They never suggested the possibility of devaluation of our properties. They never talked about the possible difficulties of mortgaging, refinancing, or getting home insurance. 
and they never warned that if there were accidents, spills, methane seepage, or other drilling calamities, that one neighbor would be forced to sue now, another. Now, some people went ahead and signed leases, but many of us had moved to Colden specifically for its beauty and rural character and refused to sign. We started investigating, and when we understood what hydraulic fracturing was, we started fighting it. We warned our neighbors. We testified before our board. In response, our board passed a six-month moratorium. We started working towards a full ban, but in Colden, it turns out, passing a ban is not so easy because the gas industry always, already apparently had targeted Colden for something else. You see, the town of Colden is the site of many old vertical wells drilled as far back as the 50s. Some are still productive, but most are These not. These old wells are called the Colden Storage Field. Long before we passed our original moratorium in April, National Fuel had already obtained permits from FERC and the DEC in New York to drill new horizontal wells into the Medina Sandstone, ostensibly to connect non-producing wells and to stimulate them so that gas would flow easily into and out of the rock. National Store Fuel the plan, and pump it out when the price is high and sell it. While these storage wells were being drilled, there were workers on the site around the clock. The big were lighted all night and spewed plumes of vapor laden with chemicals into the air. The deafening sound of drilling woke whole families in the middle of the night. During the day, the noise and vapors continued while the drilling trucks were seen careening past stop signs and tearing branches off trees in front yards where small children played. Just as might happen with high volume frac fracking, chemicals were pumped into the ground, tailings with unknown toxins were plowed into the earth, and drilling wastewater was trucked for disposal to unnamed locations. National Fuel reportedly told our town board that the chemicals were being used, and I quote, these chemicals were environmentally friendly. <laughs> Yet most were described in their very own material safety data sheets as hazardous in some way to various degrees. Some can cause harm to eyes. Some can cause vomiting. Some can be flammable. Some cause harm to respiration. Some may cause cancer, may be mutagenic, cause endocrine, developmental, immune system, brain and nervous disorders, kidney disease, and some may cause acute aquatic toxicity. Aquapac, Biocide, Polyplus, Concor, and others, these are the environmentally friendly chemicals. Further, according to the board, National Fuel said that it was absolutely not fracking. It was stimulating the wells. <laughs> Lies! Legalese. But like all of you, I've read the gas company literature, and I've seen that the industry uses the word fracking interchangeably with the word stimulation. In a summer when drought threatened Colden's well water, giant industry pump trucks were observed pulling water for drilling right out of our local creeks. Oh, wow. Now these wells were not qualified as high volume horizontal hydraulic fracturing. They were just horizontal wells and they just stimulated. But anyway, when Holden planned to extend its moratorium on the process, National Fuel reportedly went to our town board and threatened a lawsuit if we didn't cooperate and write our legislation to include a clause exempting National Fuel and other companies like it from the legislation. Boo! Boo! That makes sense. Right. <laughs> Why is National Fuel trying to write our laws? What does the company want to do to our beautiful little town? The storage field already threatens our little town. Allowing high volume hydraulic fracturing in Colden would only amplify what we're going through. You know, 30 years ago, there was a simple article in the Harvard Business Review. It warned businessmen that in order to make money over time, they should determine essential service their business supplies to the public and then make sure that they supply that service. For example, a company that produced horse-drawn carriages shouldn't think of itself as a horse-drawn carriage business, but as a transportation business. So when the automobile was invented, it was time to switch gears, forgive the pun, and make cars, or soon a business would be bankrupt. So what's wrong with the modern gas industry? Does it lack invention? Is it archaic? Yes! Is it outmoded? Yes! Yeah. Its mission is to provide energy and it's still only providing gas. 
sure it can make money, it stacked the deck. In 2005, oil and gas czars hid in back rooms with ex-Vice President Cheney of Halliburton and made deals oh! to protect this dinosaur. Making public policy that exempts the industry from meeting the clean air and water standards that other industries and even every real person is required to meet. I am a person, and I am not allowed to foul even my own property with chemical waste by pouring old chemicals down my drain or burning into or burning substances that'll produce noxious vapors. And I would never do that. But the gas industry can pour 160 to 285 tons of chemicals into the earth for one hydrofract well, and and run and run drill rigs pouring methane into the atmosphere. Wrong. The modern gas industry is about 150 years old, and it still doesn't do what every seven-year-old is expected to do. Wipe, wipe its own behind. <laughs> On September 10th of this year, the online magazine EcoWatch stated that according to Governor Cuomo and eco-hero Bill McKibben, fracking is the gut-check issue of his governorship. He can either pioneer a path forward by banning fracking and have New York lead this nation with a 21st century energy policy that embraces renewable energy, or he can take us back to the fossil fuel dark ages. If he chooses the latter, he may become the governor who poisoned New York, creating the greatest public and environmental disaster in New York's history. Governor Cuomo's decision on fracking will either mark him as a hero and a national leader or mark the end of his political career. Governor Cuomo, I call on you to save my dream, to save the dreams of hundreds of thousands of others, to save my little town of Colden, to save Western New York, to save the state of New York, and to ban fracking now. coming all the way down here to tell your story. It was, it was absolutely an atrocity what they're doing to you guys in Colden. And I'm really happy that folks here are going to know about it now and be able to mobilize around it. Um, it's just unfair for certain communities to be targeted this way by national fuel with the threat of lawsuits. I mean, attacking um, community members that are just trying to stand up for what it is they believe in and for their own health. I mean, how shameful of an industry is that we're really going to be hearing from is going to be talking about uh, an issue that's really been plaguing Niagara Falls in Western New York, and it's this issue of wastewater disposal. Right. Uh, it has been banned right now in Niagara Falls, but we're really afraid of litigation. Um, as you can see, these gas industry folks are not afraid to sue these small towns, um, and areas like Niagara Falls really just cannot afford a huge court battle. Um, so please put your hands together uh, for biologists, retired biologists, and Western New York Peace Center Interim Director Charlie Bowman. There's a uh, serious problem with fracking, as everybody here knows. Yes. What yes. to do with the water? Um, fracking takes drinkable water and shoves it underground after mixing with hundreds of chemicals, and half of it comes back up. So there's 7 million gallons roughly for each well, 300, 3 million comes back up, the other 3 million stays down, 3 plus 3 equals 7, as everybody knows. <laughs> and, um, anyways, um, so it's down, and uh, recent research says that uh, while it's producing gas, there's an upward pressure on that water, on that heavily polluted water, the most polluted water perhaps in the history of the world. Right. And no one knows how to clean it up. Right. Uh, right. And uh, so there's a huge problem on what to do with the three million <laughs> gallons that comes back up for each well. And so what do they do? They transport it to Ohio. Uh, the, half, the half of the water comes back up, the millions of gallons uh, gets transported to uh, Ohio, where the geology of Ohio is such that they can inject it nine, ten thousand feet underground, and uh, inside the city of Youngstown. And what happens to Youngstown when they do that? 
Right. It was Earthquake City. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the rate of earthquakes went up by 10,000 percent or something like that. I mean, it's on the order of thousands of percent. So, um, my brother-in-law lived there and he said he never had an earthquake, but now they have lots of earthquakes. And so they banned the injection of hydrofracking wastewater inside the city, but they still got other wells around Ohio. And uh, there's an upward pressure on that water, too, so uh, succeeding generations will have to deal with it. Um, so there's an immense effort to figure out how to clean up hydrofracking wastewater. And the Niagara Falls Water Board looked at that issue and said, hey, we got millions of gallons of unused capacity at our water board here along the Niagara River just above the falls. Okay, so anything that gets, gets out of the Niagara Falls water board goes into the Niagara River, uh, over the Niagara Falls, and uh, into the nostrils of the uh, tour boat people below the falls that we brought our relatives this summer and we breathe some of that. So. But anyways, um, so that's what's going to happen if they don't do the job properly. And uh, so they're trying to figure out how to do the job properly so they can attract uh, millions of gallons of wastewater, hydrofracking wastewater, into Niagara Falls and earn millions of dollars of profits out of that. Um, so, what was they began their research last year, and what did they find? No one knows. So, uh, the Sierra Club, the North Niagara, the, um, Western New York Drilling Defense, uh, Western New York Peace Center. Uh, went to the hearings last. Uh, went to their hearings last fall, and we said, "Okay, what'd you find? You know, release your findings." And uh, silence out of the Niagara Falls Water Board. And so uh, Grisotti and um, Gallivan held hearings in uh, Canandaigua last uh, December, and the head of the Niagara Falls Water Board said, uh, "Yeah, we're we're watching uh, about 30 constituents of concerns. In other words, heavily." heavily toxic uh, metals and radioactivity and so forth. We're monitoring that. We're cleaning it up. And uh, here, here's uh, here's some example of that. They showed some dirty hydrofracking water and some clean looking hydrofracking water. And uh, Gallivan asked them, is that drinkable? And they, Paul Troffs immediately said no. You know? <laughs> so uh, we want to know how what their progress is, the details, the bench studies of their laboratory exercises. And uh, they're not sharing that. Then why aren't they sharing that? Uh, we said we can help them interpret that if they uh, share that experience with us. And um, so far, it's silence. It's secret. It's a great secret. And that secrecy continues. And what happened? In the Niagara Falls, uh, the city of Niagara Falls uh, wonderfully banned uh, hydrofracking in the city, and they also banned the transportation of hydrofracking wastewater, the storage of uh, hydrofracking wastewater in the city limits. And the Niagara Falls set a water board is inside the city limits, uh, thankfully, uh, of the Niagara Falls. So, what happens on August, uh, the mid August, mid August 16th or 17th? Uh, the Niagara Falls reporter shows a picture of hydrofracking wastewater stored inside the Niagara Falls Water Board in a hood. Uh, boom, right. This is, uh, you know, uh, four or five months after, or, you know, uh, after the ban. So uh, the Niagara Falls Water Board is, was, breaking, breaking the law. And so what happens? The chief of police shows up. The, um, uh, the head of uh, code enforcement shows up. And they, uh, Paul Dorof says, oops, we'll get rid of it. An hour later, it's gone. And uh, there's no ticket, there's no fine, there's no uh, court process started. Um, I just want to make an announcement that anybody live inside the city of Niagara Falls in this group, please raise your hand. Anybody who lives inside the city of Niagara Falls, please raise your hand. Where? I can't see you. Okay. All right, you you can uh, bring charges for that. The, 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 the council of Canada, that resolution that they passed allows Niagara Falls citizens to bring charges in uh, New York State Supreme Court. Uh, you know when when that law is broken, and it's quite clear that there's good documentation that the law was broken. 
Uh, the other per people who can bring that are the city officials themselves, and they've been silent on this. And so actually the citizens of Niagara Falls can actually begin this court process, and uh, uh, we can help with fundraising on that. So uh, that's something to think about. Uh, we shouldn't let that get away silently. And so um, we wrote a letter to uh, the Niagara Falls reporter, and we reminded them of that hearing last December, and they uh, published our letter here a couple weeks ago, and they all wrote a, uh, a, another article in, somewhat in response to that, and also as a result of that. And uh, thankfully, one of the city council people uh, is pursuing this further. He, he wants to know there's, there's uh, paperwork signed when hydrofracking water gets received or uh, you know by someone. You know, you say you give it to Corporation X. Corporation X has to sign for that, and so there's a search for that documentation. And why is it so difficult to, for this documentation to be surfaced? I mean, it should be in someone's filing cabinet, and it shouldn't take more than a half an hour to find it. So. Uh, uh, you know, we need all these uh, FOIA requests, which is ridiculous. They should be up front with their research. Uh, they should be up front with their paperwork. And so there's, uh, trans it's called transparency. Uh, anyways, that's the uh, uh, update on the, this uh, water treatment in, uh, proposed water treatment in, in Niagara Falls. What did they do with the, with the wastewater they found? What did they do? Good. <laughs> yeah, thank you for reminding me. I had notes on that. Um, yeah. Okay. So it was gone, and um, who took it? it it's, a, it's now presumably residing in Amherst, New York, just about a half mile from uh, the University of Buffalo. Nice. And it's uh, full UB Shell Institute. So I think. <laughs> um, so anyway, the uh, talk about karma. It is now uh, the uh, company called GD. B, I think, uh, GDB, uh, which is a worldwide engineering environmental services company, uh, some representative of that company picked it up. And so the paperwork that's being searched for by the city councilman is, uh, you know, they're, they're being approached by that person. And we should uh, perhaps uh, think about doing something in front of that. There's a, they, they're given... Uh, three, two or three addresses in uh, Amherst within a mile of each other. It's not clear where what office ha received the hydrofracking wastewater. But the, the key issue is what the hell are they doing with it? You know, this stuff never goes away. Once you make it, it is permanent. And so it, it sits in someone's backyard. And so the people who yell the loudest get it moved, but it goes into someone else's backyard. So, so let's, you know, we should have a policy of not creating the damn stuff in the beginning. I mean, right. and this is, we should, you know, when you have renewable energy, you don't worry about this kind of crap. So, um, anyways, uh, so the company's name oh, is, uh, is sitting uh, within about a couple miles from my wife and I house now. It's moved from Niagara Falls to closer to our house. So, anyways, um, uh, you know, what, what are they doing with it? And that needs to be ferreted out. And I hope the, uh, the newspaper uh, can find, uh, you know, some reporter time to figure that one out. And hopefully we can uh, pursue that matter ourselves and give them some encouragement. So that's uh, the update. Any other questions? How many gallons? How many gallons? There's about uh, seven and a half, eight gallons, I estimate, from the photographs. And uh, I'm making an ed educated guess that the only thing they did with clean up the hydrofracking wastewater was to shove it through a, uh, a filter, I, I, I would say a millipore filter, and they had a suction device uh, photographed in the, uh, in the Niagara Falls re re reporter, uh, so I, that's all they did. And I'm, I'm, if they did any more than that, I'd be surprised. And that's, that's what, it was just a show and tell, a pretty picture for them to show uh, Grisanti and Galvin. So uh, that's probably why they're being so secretive, because they didn't do a damn thing except make it look pretty. But it's still just as toxic as it was before. So thank you. All right, guys, here's the deal. we got a camera right here, and all the folks at home have to know how much we support a ban on fracking. So we're going to do a chant. I want you to hold up your signs real high. The guys that are in the front, get, get in the crowd so that the camera can get you guys with the sign. Hold your sign up. 
So I'm going to show you how the, the chant goes. It's going to go, no, frack no, hydrofracking has got to go. 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 No, frack no. Oh, 
Senator Mark Rossani wants to bring a private wastewater treatment plant here to Western New York because there are no public water treatment plants in New York State that can treat this. No, or anywhere. At the end of the day, the frack wastewater that would be treated in any treatment plant is not drinkable. The final product from treatment would be at levels determined by the EPA for maximum parts per billion available to be re released into streams or rivers. Some of these toxins are unknown and do not even have safe levels established. What makes our representatives think that the residents living downstream and have intake plants from these waters will want chemicals and no carcinogens going into their water supply? Dilution is not the solution to pollution. The waste is radioactive and full of heavy metals and benzenes, to name a few. The carcinogens and pollutants that would be filtered from the waste can wind up in a landfill near you or be burned and released into the air that we breathe. They only recycle so much. Eventually it has to go somewhere. Right. As for the supposed job creation, our own ecology and environment did the economic impact study. <laughs> they based their estimates on vertical wells that can last up to 30 years. Horizontal wells have not been proven to last more than seven years. Right. In New York, they want to drop three quarters of the proposed wells. 38,000 gas wells they want to drop in 10 years. And they claim that transients will do the work for those first 10 years. Once they frack a well, they move on to the next. You don't see people standing around staring at gas wells. 38,000 wells at 5 million gallons of water are frack. They can frack in eight different directions. It can permanently contaminate in upwards of 2.5 trillion gallons over the course of 10 years, never to return to the hydrological cycle. That ain't right. As for the economic stimulus, Pennsylvania is broke. <laughs> it only received $1.5 billion over five years. Now, this is nothing to laugh at or shake a fist at, but it's hardly the billions that they've proposed and promised. Only 97 out of 900 companies who are doing business directly or indirectly in the Marcellus Shale play, only 97 of those 900 paid corporate income taxes last year. Oh. Is that 10%? Oh, yeah. The industry and royalty owners are losing money with gas at $3 and MCF, and so do you in tax revenue. Right. And production levels dropped 70% on horizontal wells in the first year. To push up the price of gas, the industry is advocating power plants and cars to switch to natural gas. And they even want to export liquid natural gas, which is energy independence oxymoron. This drives up the price with demand. Yet the estimates for what's down there continue to decrease yet again this month. They are now saying that there is less than a five-year supply. See where you'll be in ten years, New York, when the jobs and the money are gone with the gas. It's just plain short-sighted. I knew growing up in Niagara County, witnessing the damage of Love Canal, and being surrounded by the largest surface freshwater supply on Earth called the Great Lakes, Right. That I would someday have to protect this most precious resource, water. Water is life. Right. We look for signs of life on other planets by looking for water. Right. 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 Don't let our representatives become more interested in protecting their special interests than exercising their fiduciary duty to protect their tax-paying residents. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of the industry's lies presented to us like it will somehow benefit, benefit us, when in actuality, it benefits the Koch brothers. I'm sick of their false promises of job creation, false claims of energy independence when they really want to export it, and their overinflated claims of economic stimulus. The data does not add up. So I urge 
Protect Protect you, Western New York. Protect all of New York. Yeah, Protect yeah. the Great Lakes. Protect yeah. our water supply. Protect the air that we breathe. Yeah. And protect our food shed. A major threat has arrived at the door and it's up to us as voters and voices heard to protect this country's most valuable resource. Once you frack, you can't go back. Man fracking stay away now. Vermont did it, we can too. Pennsylvania over fracking and I apologize that I don't have more. I just have a, a couple little points. Uh, first is that five wealthy counties in southeastern Pennsylvania are exempted from gas drilling for six years. Yeah. I don't have the list but they're in southeastern Pennsylvania. Now Act 13 limits uh, municipalities right to limit gas drilling. Uh, the gas in industry pressure even restricted temporary moratoriums. Now you remember that Pittsburgh uh, achieved a moratorium, but uh, industry has reversed that. Wow. Okay. Governor Tom Corbett uh, overturned former Governor Ed Rendell's executive order limiting additional drilling on state-owned land. More accidents have occurred uh, than in any other state. There have been 3,300 environmental violations by gas companies between 2008 and 2011. Now the Riverdale Mobile Home Village in Jersey Shore has been uh, uh, they can extract 3 million gallons per day. 
Now the New York, Maryland, and Delaware River Basins have each imposed a moratorium, but the Susquehanna River Basin uh, Commission approved a multi-billion dollar uh, gallon H2O withdrawal permits. Oh, no. the, the, residents, the residents of the Riverdale community have been offered $2,500 per resident to relocate, even though it's going to cost uh, between $5,000 and $12,000 per resident to move out of there. So they haven't been offered anything else. Now that's all I have in Pennsylvania. I just want to make one more point that I think it's important that the, the anti-fracking coalitions, not just here, but uh, around the country, link up with what's happening in the anti-war movement, because the, the Washington keeps telling us that if you, you know, if we have all this fracking and we extract, we're going to, you know, limit you know, our, our dependence on foreign oil. That's not true. You know, the oil extraction in the world is the most profitable uh, energy industry, and they're still going to have wars in Syria and Libya and all over the place uh, because that is the most profitable in energy. So even if they extract every ounce of natural gas from the ground and pollute the whole country and the whole world in the process, they're not going to stop oil production. So it's important for us to link up. That's all I have. Hi, my name is Linda Schneekoff, and I'm the chair of the Sierra Club Niagara Group. And what I want to ask everybody to do is to be in touch with Food and Water Watch. Go online and tell them to thank you for the support that they've given us in the form of Rita Yelda over here, who has actually organized almost all of this opposition locally. All of us are against it, but it takes somebody standing out there in front put all of these pieces together. So tell her bosses how wonderful she is. And, uh, and, that we want her. Her. and that we want her back. Well, we want her to stay, right. So thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to be doing our street theater now. We have our cow. We have our Governor Cuomo. Where are we missing? Where is Farmer Brown? <laughs> Farmer Brown. Farmer Brown. Farmer Brown did his car tow. Farmer Brown. Woo! <laughs> no, not Farmer Brown's tractor. <laughs> so uh, this street theater is about fracking and our food chat and how the southern tier could be impacted and how our food could be impacted um, and, and exposed to chemicals, essentially, if we allow drilling to happen in the southern tier. Governor Cuomo has said that he does want to open up five southern tier counties to drilling. Unfortunately, that's where a lot of our dairy comes from and a lot of our produce comes from. So it's really a huge concern. So guys, listen up. There's some really important information. What well, a lovely oh. day it is today. Betsy the cow. <laughs> Did you know that the farm work we do is really vital to New York's economy? Every new farm job in New York creates new jobs in the community. The farm economy generated $4.45 billion in 2008. About 25% of the state's land area are used by over 35,000 farms to produce a very diverse array of food products. Wow, I had no idea, Farmer Brown. Like what? Well, dairy products like yogurt and milk is a big one. New York ranks high nationally in dairy, meat, poultry, fruits, vegetables, uh, and maple syrup production. Say, Betsy, have you heard about fracking? For natural if gas? that land man visited the other day, I've been doing a lot of Googling, and it seems that fracking can lead to contaminated water. Uh, that's a bad word. F-R-A-C-K. Well, hello there. My name is Governor Cuomo, the first black governor of New York State. <laughs> and I don't think fracking is a bad word at all. In fact, they might even start fracking around here soon because it's safe. <laughs> After drinking this frackalicious, unsustainable energy water, I may okay fracking in the southern tier. <laughs> Oh, gee, I don't know. Us farmers have been hurting lately, but I heard that not only can fracking contaminate water, but it could also affect my crops and property value. Regulation doesn't look like it will protect us farmers and soil contamination due to leaks, flares, explosions, fires, and experimental disposal methods. What about the spills of toxic fracking, chemicals that can contaminate the groundwater and cropland are used for farming? That's nonsense. I've been assured by the gas industry that they've done this before and it's all under control. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I'm thirsty.
Sitting out here on the farm, it looks like there's no, there is no real system in place to test effective meat or dairy. Even when exposure by fracking chemicals may be, may be suspected. Can I have a taste of that? <laughs> yeah, you're right. The National Residue Program, which monitors known chemical residues, is missing key heavy metals and chemicals to inspect our dairy, meat, and eggs. Wow. And Governor, what about Pennsylvania? Last year, when 28 beef cattle encountered fracking fluid that seeped out of a holding pond, the cows gave birth to 11 calves the following spring, but shockingly, only three calves survived. Oh, what's, hap what's happened in Pennsylvania? F-R-A-C-K sounds even worse than before. All of a sudden, I feel sick. Now, now. <laughs> now, now. Don't you all want jobs and money? No. That's really the bottom line. <laughs> clean jobs, clean jobs. Clean jobs. And clean water. water. I don't know, Governor. <laughs> Gas will bring an estimated $16 billion over the next 20 years, but the industries it will affect, such as wildlife watching, wildlife watching, hunting and fishing, dairy, grapes and wine, farms and tourism, tourism will bring $350 billion over the next 20 years. It doesn't seem like a fair trade to me. There are better ways to make money for the state that doesn't put farmers like me at risk for loss of revenue and loss of consumer confidence in my products. Oh. 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 The cow's dead! Oh no! Whoa, whoa, you killed the cow! Oh no. Oh. Sacrificial cow. <laughs> when, I was on, when, when I was on the internet, I saw a research out of Penn State that states that areas of Pennsylvania with 150 or more Marcellus Shale gas wells have seen an average decrease in milk production of 18.5%. Wow. Whereas the area without active gas drilling increased milk production about 1%. Uh, so you mean the FRACK can impact the revving up and growing of New York's dairy industries to meet the growing demand for yogurts and other milk products? What will happen to dairy cows like me? Dairy production is far more long term, sustainable, economically invigorating, and environmentally friendly business for this state. Stinking shell gas extraction. Yay! Yeah. Look, That's right. look, if you don't want to make money, it's your loss. But I've been assured that there's nothing to worry about and that the chemicals used in fracking are safe. For ma formaldehyde, benzene, toluene, ethyl methyl something or other. All sounds good to me. Let's yeah. <laughs> light the water on fire. Yeah. As news of contamination spreads, we must assure that dairy cows like me and the products I produce will help will help relativize the state's rural econ economic economy. There's a solution that works for the entire state that will make us money without sacrificing our food shed. New York has the opportunity to both revitalize the statewide economy and meet its energy needs through the development of clean, sustainable energy sources. Our focus now should be on maximizing New York's potential to become a national leader through establishment of a vibrant, renewable energy policy. Not supporting the growth of dirty, stinking, fracking drilling that puts our health and environment at risk. You know, you're right. The fact that it must have gotten to my head. If our land becomes contaminated, there goes the state's livelihood. The fruit and vegetables of New York could also be impacted. Grasslands, un unusable for grazing. Groundwater, unsuitable for human and animal consumption. If I hurt New York's economy and farmers like this, I'll never become president. I better get back to my office and sign a ban on fracking in New York. I've seen the light. Thank you. <laughs> Good time, guys. All right, we're going to do a big group photo. Um, I really want to do it on the steps here. So if we could just start lining up on the steps. If you don't have a sign, um, I have a couple of signs left. I think it'll be really great to have a group photo to give to the governor. Yeah.
Uh, Chuck, Chuck. Who doesn't have a Chuck, sign? Whoever Please. doesn't have a sign. Chuck, Chuck. Chuck, come on. Oh, we have to steal your I'll more. Speak. I'll take you to kind of one. Oh, well, yeah, put it in your window. I know. I know. It's a Yeah. Uh, I want you guys to be 